Y'all want to go to the tape? Y'all want to break down some plays here? Greg has uh, provided us with a list of plays. Now, these are not coaching tape plays, so, you know. Important to remember. Right, when, I, when I look at these now, we'll, we'll try to, uh, you know, make some sense of them for you guys. So let's start with, uh, with the Florida game, Sean, if we could. It was a 19-yard completion to the tight end Jordan Dingle in the first quarter, uh, and you'll see the oh, play okay. play out. Now, the, notice he was under center. This is a very common play that you see in the NFL. It's what we call bang play action. It has a run game element to it. They pull the guard, which is called gap scheme, a gap scheme run. You can see they're going to pull the guard. It's quick play action, and you suck the linebackers in, and you just throw it right over the top of them. It's an easy throw. Tom Brady used to do this all the time and hit Gronkowski with it. That's a play you see in the NFL all the time. It's in every playbook. It's that quick bang run action, the pulling guard, makes it look like a run so the linebackers step up. All you need them to do is to step up and, and take one step forward. You, and you see how they attack the run? And boom. It's, it's a play that's often used in first down or normal down in distance situations uh, because the run element is always there. And as I said, he's under center. So he's done this. And, you know, Talk about using it on first down and, and the use of bang play action, as you call it. That used to be something the Titans executed at a very, very high Very well, very well. You'd see Tannehill do that a lot. And they've, it's not necessarily that they've moved away from it. They still try and use it from time to time. But at least, Greg, in the last couple of years watching this team, and, and especially in the absence of A.J. Brown, which I know is still a sore subject for some of you. Um, oh, is he not here anymore? Yeah, <laughs> that is. I got a lot of radio out of that, Greg. <laughs> I, I don't want to say it was a good thing, but I got a lot of radio out of it. Uh, with, with the Titans and how teams are playing them now, is there something that you're noticing on the tape that they're playing that bang play action concept, especially in the middle of the field, those play action crossers that we talk about. I'm sure a lot of you guys yeah. can picture the play, the exact play that we're talking about because they've run it with A.J. Brown. They've won it, run it with Corey Davis. They did it a couple of well, times yeah, with that, That's Westbrook a little Akina. different play because that's the, the slant being right. off the play action. This is a little bit of a different play. Um, conceptually, they're somewhat similar. Um, you're going to get a reaction from the defense because you have to understand that and this is something else that you hear all the time, and, it's, and I can tell you as a fact, it's untrue. You don't need to run the ball well to have a play-action passing game. And that's been proven over and over and over again. And every time I hear announcers say that on TV, I cringe because they're wrong. You don't need to be able to run the ball. There is not a single second-level player, meaning a linebacker, that is thinking that. They are reacting to their keys. So if you're going to have a run look on first and 10, they're going to react to it. it. That's just the way it is. You know, think back to, I'll give you an example. Obviously, we know the Titans have had a really strong run game with Derrick Henry for the last, what, four or five years, give or take? Yeah. Yeah. But just think back for we those. Got some side applause for Derrick. Is that what I heard? <laughs> I see some 22 jerseys out here. There's no question. You know. We'll get to him later. The, a team like the Titans, they don't have to establish the run in any given game. It's already established based on all the film study that the defense did leading up to the game. They know about Derrick. You know, the team defenses don't go into playing the Titans going, oh my God, Derrick Henry's there. What do we do now? That, that's, they've been studying that all week. That's what teams do. It's all based on probability and tendency. That's what game planning is. You know, that's why sometimes if teams step away from what they do, let's say, let's say you build something because it is all based on probability and tendency, based on what you see on film, and you find out a team does something 82% of the time in a certain situation, well, that's what you think they're going to do. Now, they may on that given play do the other 18%, and you know what? The defense wins that play. You, take, you tip your hat and you say more power to them. That's the way it works. But it's all based on probability and tendency, and teams know that the Titans can run the ball. They don't have to establish the run in any given game. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure a lot of people have strong opinions about how often the Titans coaching staff feels that they are. And, you know, we're not in those meeting rooms. And no. it's, it's tough to – and we'll talk about this, I think, towards the end sure. of the podcast, the criticism of coaching in real time because that's certainly ah. something that, that Titans fans have gone through with their last play caller. They've got a new play caller this year. Um, well, I'm going to here. I'm going to say something, you know, and, and hopefully this doesn't change anybody's opinion of me. But uh -oh. one thing that I've learned 
over the years watching tape and talking to coaches is how much I don't know and how much you can't possibly know unless you're in the meetings. So it's always easy after the fact to criticize. That's very, very easy. And for people who listen to me on the, on, uh, the podcast with Buck or on 3HL on Thursday afternoons, you'll notice that I don't normally criticize people, you know, because there's just too many things you can't possibly know because you'd have to be there. I mean, I've been really fortunate. You know, one of the things uh, since the pandemic hit, one of the things I've been able to do is have these great Zoom calls with coaches who are willing to spend two hours with me, you know, on a Zoom call showing me plays, going over plays, concepts, and they, t and they tell me things, and I'm like, oh, man, why didn't I know that? You know, because there's just some things you can't know because you don't know how it's coached, you don't know what players are told, I mean, it's one thing to know a concept. I can sit here like that concept we just did on, on the pass play. I know the concept, but you don't necessarily know how everybody's taught. You're not there. So it's always easy to criticize when things don't work, but there are so many things we just don't know. No question. Uh, let's take a look at some more Will Levis plays uh, from the Miami-Ohio game. He had a 45-yard completion to Tavion Robinson in the first quarter that I think the audience is going to enjoy watching, Greg. And, and there's a couple of plays from this game of Will Levis that I know you wanted to highlight yeah, here. Yeah, well, it's, uh, let me take, again, again, you see he's under center. Again, play action. To, now notice the boot action. See, this is the kind of thing, this is a Rams 49ers staple. With the boot action, they, what they call outside zone to one side, you boot away from that because what the outside zone does with the offensive line working that way, you'll see that. The offensive line is going to work to the side of the run fake. You get Levis out naked. There's no one there. And there's the movement part. This, if, this was early in the season, I believe. This was in weeks, certainly within week three or four, I believe. Yeah, this was one of the first games yeah, of the season. Yeah, yeah. And you notice the movement, which you didn't see much later in the season because he couldn't do it. Um, because he had in, uh, the injuries I mentioned. But this is the kind of stuff that should be effective with the Titans. Uh, and it's one reason I wanted to show this play. And you get him with the boot action outside. There he was to his left. It works off the run action. You get defensive flow to the run. And it's a misdirection element. That, that's the kind of play that is. It's what we call misdirection. Because you get flow one way and you work back the other way. And that's the kind of thing that they did a lot of in, in August. They wanted to really build that and build and build and build those kinds of concepts. And that's something they had to stop because of his injuries. Right. And uh, if you guys have questions for Greg about Will Levis, we're going to do a Q&A about the quarterback. And then we're going to do some more breakdowns with players. And we'll get to those guys specifically later. So if you've got questions, be thinking about them because we'll get to that here in just a moment. But that mobility part of it, Greg, we talked about the injuries to start. Oh, yeah. How critical is the mobility for this quarterback, especially in the kind of offense that he projects to run and obviously in the offense that he was running the last couple of Yeah, I of years. think it's really critical because obviously Derrick Henry's still here. They do want to run the ball. That's a foundational approach. And you want to be able to do things off of that buck. That's absolutely critical. You know, so you want to have the play action pass game. You can have him drop straight back. But you want to have the movement element because of the misdirection. You know, the misdirection is a critical piece. It gets the defense moving one way. You work back the other way. That's really a critical piece of what the Titans want to do and what Levis is capable of doing when he's healthy. Let's uh, take a look at another play before we get to some questions for the audience here. Uh, obviously, a lot of Vols fans in the house. Uh, not one of Will Levis's best performances this year, although in 21, he, I mean, it, they didn't come out on the winning side of that, and Tennessee fans love playing Kentucky for right. exactly that reason. Um, but there was a lot of good tape in the 21 game, and in 22, I know there was, they were, there were, you were able to find some highlights in that as well. They also had a bad old line this year. They had lost four guys, Kentucky, to the draft the year prior and only had one returning starter, and it was a bad old line. Yeah, well, they lost Wandale Robinson, obviously, going in the second round gone. to the Giants. They lost a lot of talent on that Kentucky yep. team. But this is a 24-yard completion from that Tennessee game to the tight end in the first quarter that I, uh, I know that... I think you, I remember this one, yeah. I'm certain you do. There's, yeah. a, there's a lot going on in that break. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. <laughs> but from, mm -hmm. that, from that Tennessee tape, in that game, that was that was later in the year. Obviously, the injuries we've discussed. Yeah. What should the audience be looking for in this play? Well, again, <laughs> you see the play action. Um, th this is a really strong touch throw, and this is to the tight end. And what you're going to see here is straight eye formation. 
We actually, we actually saw a similar play where, uh, with Chig with the, uh, the Titans this year where he lined up as an I-formation fullback and you work through the line of scrimmage. Again, you get the run action element and look how that gets the defense to step up and that's all you need. All you need is a step, a step and a half and then that's a beautiful touch throw. This is a schemed play, beautifully designed. It has an ISO run look. With the, with the I formation fullback. In this case, it's a tight end, just like Tennessee will likely do. And then you get him on a vertical route to the sideline. So this is the kind of play that you're, you're likely to see with the Titans. Absolutely. They've, they've got a pretty interesting collection of skill position players that I know a lot of Titans fans had frustrations about right. a lack of additions to that skill position group that we'll get well, to probably here. Probably a wide receiver, yes. Wide receiver in particular. Everybody yeah. in the world seemed to think that they were going to take a wide receiver, and they did get one. No, they didn't. No. They didn't. We'll, we'll talk about Colton Dowell a little there'll later. Be, there'll be auditions for the wide receiver at the end of this. Can you run around? Uh, not anymore. <laughs> I, 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 although I did run a 4840 in college. I had to get time for baseball. 484 is pretty good, yeah. bud. Yeah. I got think of like a 5-2. Of course, that was a long time ago, Buck. It's all right. Yeah. I won't tell anybody. Yeah. So now we're going to take some questions on Will Levis in particular. Uh, our promotions uh, uh, executive extraordinaire, Rich Ferris, is going to walk around with a microphone. Now, uh, so if you've got a question for Greg on the quarterback, raise your hand and Rich will bring the microphone around. we got one up front here. Rich, if you would be so kind, just give us your name and let hey. us know. Uh, my name is J.P. Perkins. Uh, First, I could listen to you talk football all week. I appreciate uh, that. I agree. Thank you. I absolutely agree. My second question, or my question is, being as we're not going to be in the Super Bowl. I mean, Greg. Te <laughs> teams with no receivers don't get in the Super Bowl. Oh, no. Uh, be that being said. Yes. Could you see the benefit and going ahead and trading Tannehill, since you've only got three years, really, to uh, to evaluate Levis. Let Greg answer the question, kids. It's okay. Um, you know, I, I don't think that, first of all, I don't think Tannehill would, would bring a lot, first of all. Um, in terms of trade value. In terms of trade value. And I don't think, because you have a rookie quarterback, in Levis, and granted, there's there's different schools of thought on rookie quarterbacks. No quarterback is truly ready to play as a rookie. Now, that doesn't mean they shouldn't play or should play. Those are become individual situations with given teams and the player. Um, but so the question becomes: What you're really asking is, should Will Levis be the starting quarterback week one? That's essentially what you're asking. Because if you're gonna if you believe they should trade Tannehill, then Will Levis is gonna be your starting quarterback. As an abstract point of principle, I don't have a problem with that, but I don't think that's gonna happen. I think that I think that this organization, and it starts really with Mike Vrabel, you know, in terms of how he sees the game. I don't believe in their mind, even though they traded up to get Will Levis, that they believe for half a second, right or wrong that they're in a rebuilding mode. I don't believe they think that for half a second. And they're gonna play the veteran quarterback and they're gonna see how that goes. Now, if all of a sudden after seven weeks, they're two and five, I don't know when their buy is, I didn't look. Uh, week seven, all right, so because let's say, we are in London week six. Okay, so let's say they're two and four, you know. I might have to reschedule the podcast that week, by the way. That's okay. Okay. Just wanted to. I'll be in the same spot all the time. I've I, this is the yeah. first time I've seen you away from that desk. I know. I'm in the same spot all the time. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't think that they're. I believe they think that they're going to compete, and they're not going to play a rookie quarterback unless they have to. We appreciate the question, JP. We've got a, a couple over here, Rich. If you would be so kind. Greg and I don't have great visibility of you guys. If we could get the lights up just a hair, Sean, so we could see people in the audience, and just say your name so we know who we're talking to. Okay, my name is Dan Caldwell. Uh, how does the new quarterback fit with the wide receivers we have already got? <laughs> how well do they conceivably play together? Yeah, so that, within, within, the, oh. within the scheme, Greg, of, yeah. of what they've got to work with right yeah. now, maybe – yeah, Levis is obviously the talking point, but and that becomes a, a, a practice and a repetition issue.
because he has to get a feel for how these receivers, and we know that as, as a group, this would, being kind, would not be considered a good receiving group by NFL standards. Um, <laughs> just, I mean, listen, y'all call, y'all call the radio show and say the exact same I'm, thing. Get I'm out just, of here. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm just watching tape and telling you the truth. You know, <laughs> hey, I'm just a truth teller here. Morale is you know, high. Don't, don't kill the messenger. Morale is high. You know. <laughs> um, it, it becomes a, a chemistry issue. You have to work with receivers, understand how they run their routes, how they under, how you have to understand how they work their routes and their breaks uh, against different coverages. You have to understand what indicators they give you, whether it's a head feint, whether it's a stick with their outside foot in the ground. All that comes with practice because in the NFL, there's a lot of throws that have to be made with anticipation. You can't wait till the receiver breaks open. Um, you have to be able to throw the ball before. So that's a practice repetition thing. Um, then it becomes a question of scheme. Then it comes down to the play caller and the design of an offense versus a specific defense. Uh, you, again, it's all probability and tendency, as I said. If you know that you're going to get, you know, let's say a, a particular zone coverage on first and 10, you call route concepts that attack that particular zone coverage. And there's a primary read, a secondary read, and, and, and a third read. And ideally, you want the ball to go to the primary read, and that makes your quarterback feel a lot more comfortable because you've practiced that. You, you know, against cover three, let's say, which is a zone concept with a single high safety, you, you might have certain route concepts, and you run it with the idea that, hey, this guy is going to be open against cover three. So it's all repetition, it's all practice. Um, when it's more schemed to base, you don't need great receivers, but you're going to get man coverage in this league, and that's where receivers do have to win one-on-one, -on -one, and that's, as we said, that becomes a question right now as we speak tonight on uh, May, May 20th, I believe it is? That's right. As we speak I've been, tonight. I've been plugging this thing. Greg's yeah. been worried. I've been prostituting myself out yeah, too yeah, much for yeah. this thing, but, you know, it turned out you guys showed up. We were yeah. grateful for that. So on May 20th, you know, as we sit here now, you know, the, the, there's a big question as to the ability of, of this potential receiving group to win one-on-one, -on -one, which you have to be able to do, just like cornerbacks have to be able to play man-to-man. -man. Receivers have to be able to win one-on-one. -on -one. And, and we can get in t to talk about some of these receivers because a couple of them I kind of like, and we'll see how it plays out. Well, and I, Traylon Burks is one of the most fascinating players yep. on this roster this year. And we'll, we'll get uh, a few more questions in before we take a – Quick break and break down some more prospects here in just a second. Give you ch guys a chance to get to the bar, get some uh, food, and uh, get uh, keep this thing going throughout the course of the evening. But with Traylon Burks, his skill set, he only appeared in 11 games. We saw potential like the Green Bay game. In fact, the last time that the these fans saw the Tennessee Titans win a professional football game <laughs> was November 17th. You don't have to laugh on that hard, Greg. That was a tough one. Well, you started to laugh, so I just, I, I'm just following your lead, Buck. Oh, that's a ter don't follow my lead. That's a terrible lead, <laughs> which is unfortunate because I'm leading the conversation. But um, his skill set and what he brings to the table, there was, there was at least from our standpoint, watching them and covering them on a, on a day-in, day-out basis, week-in, week-out, there was such a noticeable impact when he was just on the field because he can get behind the secondary. He's not necessarily a burner in the way that you talk about, but he can win those one-on-one -on -one matchups. He can get behind the secondary. He can make an impact on what they're trying to run offensively that immediately it just felt like it got constipated as soon as he was off the field. Yeah, and, and again, just so people understand, I sit in my office and I watch tape. I don't interview players. I don't know players. I can't speak to work ethic. I can't speak to other variables that are not based on tape. But when he came out of Arkansas, his college tape was very good. He ran by people in the SEC. He's big. He's physical. He's got really big hands. He catches the ball. Um, I liked his tape coming out of college. In some ways, this was a bit of a lost season. I know he had the problem right away. Was it... Uh, Surf toe. And then he didn't oh, have no, an I'm issue. Sorry. He had a conditioning situation. He had a conditioning I said, situation. I spent an entire summer talking about a wide receiver with asthma. Right. So, again, I don't. those are things I did not know. But his tape was very good, and I still think he can be a good receiver. And the vertical element, even though he's not a 4-4 guy, one thing I learned, and I had to learn this the hard way years ago, and I'd be wrong on a lot of guys when I evaluated them, is guys who have length, height, Stride length is a trait, OK? 
Okay, so a lot of times you don't have to be a 4-4 guy to get vertical if you're tall because you can eat up ground quicker, particularly if you're not pressed off the line of scrimmage. Um, I certainly am not comparing Traylon Burks to Randy Moss, but that was the first time I really noticed it years ago watching Randy Moss. They would put him in motion. The Vikings, his first year in the league was 98 when they got to the NFC Championship game. And Randy Moss would go in motion to the formation, what we call Zin motion, because he was the, the Z receiver to the strong side. And he'd get free access off the ball, and it seemed like in three steps he was 15 yards down the field. You know, because it's stride length. You know, he was 6'4", and Brooks, I believe, is 6'3", somewhere around yeah. there. You know, so he's not Randy Moss. So please don't, I, I don't want people, you know, coming to me and saying, oh, he's not, about I, I know he's not Randy real Moss. Quick if you did. Yeah, yeah. But, I mean, he, he, could, he got vertical in the SEC because he had stride lane. I mean, I remember he ran by Alabama. He ran by good SEC teams and good SEC corners, guys who play in the league. So I'm very anxious to see him this year. He should not be written off. I don't know if people here are writing him off, what they think of him. But I think he's a, he's a guy to watch really carefully this year. He's going to have to stay healthy, obviously. I felt a lot better when we talked to him on, what was that, Wednesday, and he came to the podium and said, yeah, I can run a lot faster now because I can breathe. The breathing's a good thing. Breathing is a yeah. good thing. Uh, what, uh, let's get one more question in on Will Levis and the situation for Greg Cosell, if we could. Rich, you got somebody back there? Yep. Hi, Greg. It's Marty O'Haver. I am a U.K. alum, so I'm prejudiced. But Tackle for the pass. last four or five years, seemingly the Titans and Kentucky paralleled each other before this last year, the big blue wall and the Titans offensive line were exceptional. They kept their quarterbacks upright and they allowed their running games like UK with Benny Snell and Chris Rodriguez to be as good as there was in the SEC. Right. Last year, they paralleled each other because both lines were atrocious. And can you tell us even now whether the guys we're bringing in for the Titans are going to improve what happened last year, which wouldn't be difficult, but we need the quarterback upright and we need our running game to be strong enough to keep that quarterback where he can make his plays. You want me to jump in here? So I, I will say, just to kind of recap for the audience, they did add a lot of new offensive linemen. Skaronsky, uh, Jalen Duncan in the draft. Of course, they signed Andre Dillard from the Eagles in free agency and added Daniel Brunskill, who's been a swing guy. I guess, Greg, within the context of like when we talked to Mike Vrabel about this, and Vrabel basically gave us the answer, well, we saw what he was equipped with in 2021 at Kentucky. We saw how he thrived. We saw what he was without in 2022, and we saw how he struggled plus the injuries. And I guess that's kind of the genesis of the question, if I'm understanding correctly. Well, and then, correctly. It, and then it leads to the Titans. So I'll answer it this way. I believe personally that the most important player for the Titans on the offensive line is Andre Dillard. Because Andre Dillard was brought in to play left tackle. And he's a left tackle only. The Eagles tried him at right tackle a couple of years ago. He couldn't do it. He's a left tackle only. So, and they paid him a good amount of money, if I'm not mistaken. Correct? It was a pretty friendly deal. It's, uh, it's three years, 29 mil. Okay. Thank you for the guarantees. Kind of Buck Rising money, huh? I mean, listen. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> next, next contract. Careful, our bosses are here. Easy. Easy. Um, uh, so to me, Dillard's critical because if he can't play left tackle, then Skaronsky's going to have to play there, and then they're going to have issues throughout the their rest of the offensive line. Dillard was brought in, obviously, before the draft to play left tackle because they know from scouting him that that's the only position he can play. So if you can have Dillard play at a reasonably high level at left tackle and Skaronsky at left guard and Petit Frere, who I thought had a, a solid rookie season up and down, which was to be expected, but solid, and you'd expect to see improvement, then all of a sudden you know they've got three-fifths of an O-line. That's probably going to be pretty good. So I think Dillard's the key because if he can't play that left tackle – then that's going to cause a domino effect that could end up being problematic. It's a, uh, it's a high-risk, high-reward proposition um, with Dillard, it seems like. And they've done he was a first-round pick. He was. Now, he was a first-round pick. In the national in draft, a, as a matter of fact, the last time you did one of these shows here. That's right. He that's was right. a first-round pick, though, in a Mike Leach offense. Uh, Mike Leach was at Washington State at the time. So Dillard came out as a guy that 
was always in a two-point stance, never in a three-point stance, really almost never fired off the ball in the run game, which he's going to have to do with Tennessee. So he's got things, I, I mean, obviously he's been with the Eagles and he's you know, practiced these things, and he has played some in the league. Um, but, um, you know, he, he sort of fit the mold of what people look at in a left tackle. He's long, he's athletic, he's got really light feet. Um, he, you wouldn't call him a power player, but we'll see. Um, you don't necessarily have to be a power player to be able to execute certain kinds of run game blocks. Uh, but, you know, he was brought in to play left tackle. He's going to have to play there.